Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. I'm very soft-spoken, so this is a good thing. Um, <laughs> so you, you all likely know uh, the people next to me. I'll just very quickly introduce myself. Um, unlike what your program says, my name is not Rachel S. Miller. It's Rachel R. Miller. It's very important. <laughs> I'm a feminist media scholar, uh, teacher, educator, uh, small press comics critic occasionally, and editor. Uh, based out of Columbus, Ohio. I'm at Ohio State University. Um, I have with me today, I'm very honored, uh, Jaime Hernandez, uh, who for um, three, four decades now has led us through a huge world um, with his brother Gilbert in their title from Fantagraphics, Love and Rockets. And I also have with me Katie Skelly, the wonderful Katie Skelly, um, who is one of the most exciting contemporary voices um, in, in comics right now. Um, Katie uh, is known for her works such as Nurse Nurse, My Pretty Vampire, um, and her new work, Maids, which I'm really excited to talk about today. Uh, she also won the uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus Emerging Artists Award in 2015, is that correct? All right, so um, if you guys can join me in welcoming both Katie and Jaime. So Jaime let me know that you two have never been on a panel before, uh, right, in discussion before. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested, um, I just, just to get us started, I want to know how you both became aware of each other's work and what that first encounter was like for you. Mm -hmm. Shall, you go first, yeah. Shall I start? Sure. Um, I heard of her and then I looked her up, you know. Um, I. I think I heard her name before. Um, okay, actually, it was on Instagram, and she was on a friend's Instagram, and I go, hey, look at that woman. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, um, and I, I started to uh, see her work, and, and, uh, and then we met at a dinner in Columbus. Um, no, no, in Heroes, Heroes, yeah. Heroes Con. Yeah. And, uh, we just hit it off, and we're real, real good friends. And I was, I was stoked because I really liked her work, you know. And uh, so that's how I, uh, that's how I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, if I can, what was it about Katie's work that struck you? I liked. Um, uh, how do I put this? Um, I really liked uh, that her work was unapologetically uh, dangerous. I liked that she drew, what it seemed to me was uh, she drew what she wanted to draw, and I thought, wow, that's how Gilbert and I did it. We just wanted to draw stuff, and, then, and she's doing it too. She's, she's just drawing what she feels like. And I really appreciated that because it showed through. It showed the talent showed through that she was, uh, that she liked drawing what she did and she was good at it. And I hate to say that's kind of rare in comics for me, mm -hmm. for my taste. And uh, I was, uh, yeah, and, and so I just, I think she's a great cartoonist. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like Love and Rockets has just been ubiquitous in my life ever since I really came to know about comics and what comics is and what comics I like to read. Um, and so it just feels like, you know, I kind of had a lot of near misses with your work, like in the early part of my life. Um, it wasn't really until... Uh, I would say love bunglers that I really was like I'm pulled into it and I feel connected with it and less intimidated by it because it's such a huge catalog and there's so much to read and a lot of times with with really any type of comics I feel so intimidated by just how much there is um, and so that kind of like dissuades me from taking it on uh, but yeah I think it's the it's that silent spread in Love Bunglers that really just like broke my heart into a thousand pieces, and I was like, oh, Jaime's the best. Like Jaime's the best, and he's the best that there ever will be. So, oh. <gasps> <laughs> 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 so 
So I sense that there's a lot of mutual love and admiration for one another's work, but now that you've become friends and have this close friendship with one another, uh, how has that influenced or impacted your work, do you feel? I feel like I'm paying a lot more attention to the smaller details. Um, so the comic that I'm working on now called Maids, um, which Jaime has read the like what I have done so far, and he noticed like, oh, the eyes in this one character are always, are always like shifting around, because um, she's a very like nervous, like the younger sister, like she's always just kind of like darting her eyes around. And it was something that I didn't like consciously go to put in the comic, but that's something that like, you know, just kind of being able to feel characters going through space and interacting with their environment in a different way now, like that's definitely something that I'm like, Oh yeah, it's totally because Jaime and I talk about comics all the time now, you know? So it's like, it's kind of become this like, like secret language between us where like we see little things. And one thing that I think we talk about all the time is like we just love film so much, but the way that we talk about it is like, we don't talk about the overall like broad themes of a film. We like focus on very specific scenes and like just everyone's like little interactions in like just one scene specifically. Um, we just, we quote Goodfellas to each other 24 <laughs> seven and um, and just little things like, oh, you notice like Joe Pesci is just sitting there like staring at Henry, like at yeah. that dinner with the mom, with the yeah. hoof, with the paw. Um, He's and like, don't you tell her anything. <laughs> <you> tell her? <laughs> so I think it's little things like that where I'm just sort of like becoming more cognizant of like human nature and like where people's humanity and their personality shows through in just the smallest interactions. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, you should see us at dinner or just like rapid fire. <laughs> I know, I want to go to the Hernandez Skelly <laughs> School of Film Analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like she said, it's just those little, those little things that you just notice like, okay, this person is, is this person is running the scene, but look at mm -hmm. look at his face over here. Watch him, perfect, you know, or whatever, and stuff like that. And um, I really like, uh, that's the stuff I like to talk about, and mm -hmm. so did she, so that's, it's a real good connection. A conversation that doesn't end over yeah. pop culture. Um, this leads into my next, next question perfectly, because part of the pleasure for me in reading both of your work is how citational you both are in terms of your obsessions with popular culture. And you have this really lovely, both of you, mix of highbrow culture and lowbrow culture. Um, so, um, you know, I was a huge fan of Trash Twins, which was Katie's podcast with Sarah Horex, and um, Jaime is leading us through this kind of Latinx punk world of hoppers. Um, so I, I would love for you both to talk a little bit more about the influences you two share. Hmm. You want to go or you want to go? Me? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, <clears throat> you know, I grew up a, a kid, you know, watching TV all the time. And in the, I grew up in the 60s, so we had... Um, we had the Beatles come over. We had uh, Gilligan's Island come over. <laughs> we had, uh, you know, the Adams Family. Uh, you know, um, 60s trash culture was really trash, and it was just like this great thing. And I, I liked everything from, you know, crummy TV shows to, to movies to, uh, to wrestling to to monster movies, to, you know, I loved everything. And the thing that was different with me and my brothers, I had a bunch of brothers to share that with, was that um, I always thought that they were all on an equal level. I thought that a, a crummy monster movie was on the same level as a good movie, uh, or good movie. And so I just thought, I'm just this walking, encyclopedia of trash you know and <laughs> but it all belongs I think I really and I still believe that I think it it's all good it's all the same I treat it all the same especially in my comics if I'm gonna do something silly silly I still handle it with a straight face because I think it deserves that mm -hmm. and I so 
I don't know. It's it's kind of like, you know it's kind of like listening to your favorite rock song and they're talking about the Wolfman and I go I saw that movie, you know yeah yeah we get it we get it, you know it's just that connection that I always thought was a good thing instead of a, a lowbrow highbrow right. thing you know it's just all the same to me, and and I think and that's helped me um, treat it all with the same respect almost. Mm. Um, I studied art history in college, um, undergrad, and a little bit in graduate school. And so I was exposed to a lot of very like fancy theory that I don't ever get to apply any time in my life whatsoever because it's so completely useless. Um, but something that I really loved about doing Trash Twins was that we were able to kind of bring that sort of language to like trash culture in that way. And the thing that's really difficult is like everything that I love, like I love Jean Roland films, I love Hammer horror films, I love, um, you know, just like Craypax, Minara, just like artists who are like, oh, my thesis for this piece is like ass. I'm like, that's my favorite <laughs> kind of art. And the only sources on any of those things are like either really fancy theory that you read it and you're like, this is not language, I have no idea what this is. Or it's some like nut job who did like a Kindle book about it that costs like 25 cents and you're just like, oh, this person is like a criminal for sure. <laughs> I so, aspire to be both. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that is to say that it's really nice that when Jaime and I talk about like, for example, the horror films that we love, like, um, Eyes Without a Face, and like Jaime just started watching uh, Judex, the Franju film by the uh, same director. Um, it's really nice that like I can bring in something like, oh, here's like Chris Deva's theory of abjection or whatever, mm -hmm. and Jaime's like, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it just, yeah, it just feels like we have this nice sort of like balance between those two worlds. And it also kind of stops me from being as pretentious as I would have been. Like, that's a very good thing, you know, <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> to, kind of, to kind of be reeled in a little bit on, yeah, the, yeah, on sure. the theory end. For sure. We all need that. <laughs> um, this is making me wonder, um, what is something, um, something that you've loved, pop culture, film, music, whatever, that you've introduced to the other person that they, they, they didn't know before? I'm very curious. <laughs> Judex. Yeah, definitely. I never heard of that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is a 1963 French film um, by Georges Franju. I think it's Georges. Um, the director of Eyes Without a Face and this really nasty documentary called Le Sang de Bet, which is about a uh, French slaughterhouse, which is just really, really grisly. It's re I can't recommend it enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, Judex for sure is like a, it's based on a French serial. So it's very, very, very comic booky and it's very um, capes, masks, uh, women wrestling each other on a roof that comes out of nowhere. Someone's an acrobat for some reason. Uh, so yeah, I would say definitely that. Um, right. Right up our alley. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Jaime's kind of reintroduced me to wrestling and like the language of wrestling, particularly women's wrestling, um, which is something that I sort of knew about. Like I definitely knew, you know, professional wrestling and WWE and stuff like that. Um, but just sort of learning about, you know, seeing women that like were just kind of could have been your neighbor, but then they have these whole other lives as like wrestlers. Um, so that's been really cool and really interesting. Yeah. I love wrestling. It's also an obsession of yeah. mine. <laughs> um, and I think that's sometimes um, for me, it's like I need that person who introduces me to something like wrestling, mm -hmm. or for me, it was Dungeons and Dragons to like really understand what this thing is. Um, and that's a very pleasurable experience for me. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you're both on the Fantagraphics roster. Um, could you tell me how that relationship started for both of you? Well, you mean toward each other or, oh, or just, just our um, experience? Your experience from... working with Fantagraphics, oh. the publisher. Like, yeah. How did that relationship begin? And um, yeah. I, I'm also extremely interested in why Fantagraphics is the best home for, for your work, each of you. Yeah. Well, for me, for me, it was, um, you know, back in 1981, we self-published our own Love and Rockets. We, we, we had no, there was no alternative market, no, no such thing. And 
there were a few things out there like Raw and Weirdo and, and stuff like that, but we kind of had no home. You know, like, where do we go? Okay, we do it ourselves because we're crazy punk rockers and we're going to just do it anyway. Okay, that's fine. But when we had it printed, we were like, what do we do? How do we get this out there? How do you sell? What the, what's the market like? Who are, we, who are we looking for? We know they're out there, but we don't see them. You know, we go to comic shows and there's nothing like that. It's mm-hmm. just all Marvel DC and stuff. Um, and, um, and then Gilbert sent a copy to the Comics Journal to be reviewed. And Gary Groth liked it and said, can we publish this? And that was it. I mean, it was overnight. And I've been with them since. And I like, I like being with Fanagraphics. I don't think about going any other place because they've stayed with us even at our lowest points when our comic didn't sell anything. They mm-hmm. still printed us and kept doing it and kept supporting us. And uh, I don't know who else would have done that for f- almost 40 years, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so it's kind of like I got a home. I got a home to do the comics I want to do, and they let me. And I can't think of a better, <laughs> better thing. Mm-hmm. I to me, Fanta Graphics was always sort of the goal um, because when I got started, I was self-publishing and putting out this comic, Nurse Nurse, in issues and. It grew into seven issues, and then those were collected and published by Sparkplug, and then I was like, oh, that was, I mean, it wasn't too hard. Like, it, <laughs> it kind of, it took a lot, but I was like, I could do that again. And then the next book was with Ad House, Operation Margarine, and I was like, okay, like, I think I could do this again. I think I'm getting the hang of this. And then I went and pitched um, the sort of first iteration of My Pretty Vampire to Fanagraphics, and uh, Eric said no. <laughs> he has no memory of this, allegedly. <laughs> but he was like, I don't think it's quite there. Like, you know, let us know if you're doing something again later. And so I, to that point, I'd been drawing it in black and white. Mm-hmm. And then I went back and I redid it, and I kind of like took everything I was doing and threw it away. And oh, wow. I was like, I'm gonna relearn how to draw and I wanna copy you know, the artists that I really love to help get me there. And so I was looking at a lot of fanographics titles to do that, um, in particular, um, The Adventures of Jodel, the Guy Pellart collection. Uh, so I was looking at that and copying that and I was figuring out how to get my line to look like his line because it, he used brush, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of fake it, so I just started shaking my hand a lot. Um, <laughs> and that, I think it works. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was just kind of going through that and, and revisiting Fanda titles that I really loved. And then I took it back to Eric and he said yes. And I was also very lucky in that um, Jack Cohen really uh, went to bat for it at Fanographics as well. And now, um, you know, I'll be doing my third book with them. Um, so that's the official announcement, by the way. Mm-hmm. My third book is going to come out from Fanographics next fall. It's called Mates. Um, thank you. Okay. That's <laughs> you heard it here first. Yes. <laughs> you have the exclusive. <laughs> so, um, so that's going to be another big full color book. And yeah, it's really great because at first they said no, and now they can't get rid of me. Um, <laughs> and that's, th- that's a really good feeling to me. I'm like a parasite. <laughs> Not how I would characterize you, but I'm very happy that you're at home there. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just inter- you're making me think, um, wh- at what point in My Pretty Vampire did you hit upon color as one of the solutions for getting in that Fantagraphic store? It felt like it was really too easy to stay in black and white for me, and it wasn't bringing anything to the storytelling that... Um, was evolving it okay. in any way. Um, it was, because my drawing style was evolving, it was like, this needs to kind of pick up um, with something else. And right around that time was when Sarah Horrocks and I started Trash Twins. And so we started, all of these new things started coming into my life, like um, Giallo, which I knew, uh, but I didn't know the word for it. I didn't know directors other than Argento. I didn't know Fulci, whatever. Um, so that came into my life in a big way, and films by like Joel Seria and um, you know, uh, Craypax and Minara and all of these other things that I really loved. And color was just kind of like, oh, duh, like it's right there. Um, 
And so, yeah, so when you look at, um, you know, something like Suspiria, the original Suspiria, the only Suspiria, <laughs> <laughs> it colors its own character. Mm -hmm. And with, with My Pretty Vampire, I was like, oh, this could be my sort of, you know, second protagonist as I'm going through this story. I love that. The colors in My Pretty Vampire, too, are just so lush. When I, when I got the serials, I was like, oh, my God, how <laughs> beautiful. Um, I want to, uh, oh, sorry, let, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, one time you told me about your color palette, because I really, really like your color palette more than uh, other colorists. And you told me a very interesting <laughs> way you go about it. Well, I learned how to color by watching YouTube makeup tutorials. Oh my gosh. And it, was, it was really, well, because they're so good. They and are. They're so talented and they're their own kind of superstars and I love all of their drama. That's a whole other thing. But um, I, I learned, you know, what happens when you put a cool with a warm and warm with more warm. And I'm also, I have synesthesia, so like everything is kind of like affecting me at all the time, like anyway. Um, so yeah, but I, I learned from that. I, I like that. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because I am obsessed with YouTube makeup tutorials. Yeah. I, I really think I will that you watch can them learn, for hours. Yeah, you can learn a lot from that. You can see what complements what and you know how things blend together. And yeah, highly recommend that. <laughs> um, I want to backtrack a little bit, and I'll have to backtrack in our slides as well. Um, but it's interesting to me, you both started um, your careers writing science fiction. Um, with the mechanics stories, Maggie the Mechanics, and then with Nurse Nurse. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I see your careers as moving more and more steadily towards realism. Um, you know, you published Is This How You See Me, which it, it plays with time a lot, but it's not, it's not genre work, it's not science fiction. And um, of course with Maids, you're working, I f for the first time, except for your Tanya mini, mm -hmm. your Tanya Harding mini, on a historical um, story. So could you kind of talk to me about that arc from sci-fi and now pushing, like what has pulled you along that path? For me, my, my sort of in to comics was um, like reading Barbarella, and I just loved that comic like so much, and I still really, really do. Um, and I loved the comic and I loved the film. And what I particularly loved about both was that these universes didn't have to be overly complicated. They could mm -hmm. just be really bizarre. And that was enough to make it the future. It didn't have to be Moebius like giant spaceships that I would have no patience to do. It could just be like you're riding a giant rooster like through an ice planet, like, and that's, you know, enough. Uh, <laughs> And I think that that was great. And so, so I, I really wanted to do a science fiction comic that was going to be something like that. And also, there was just nothing around at the time that was like that. Um, and so, yeah, that was just kind of like an, a really good in for me to start telling a story and start throwing as many ideas as I possibly could at the page. Uh, and now, as time has gone on, I feel less like, uh, I feel more secure, I would say, mm -hmm. in that I can just tell the story and like I don't have to throw a million things at it. You so know? like a stripping away of the bells and whistles. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, my, my science fiction stuff was seriously just, um, yeah, just be, so I wouldn't have to draw a real car. You know? <laughs> so I could make them wear fancy clothes that I didn't have to get look at off the rack or mm. whatever, you know. Um, just fun, it's just fluff for me, you know, and I think fluff is fine, but when uh, when I started getting into the characters' lives and like when Maggie would go home, she would go home to her real Mexican neighborhood that was kind of based on where I lived. Mm -hmm. And that started to uh, be more important to me, telling my, my life, uh, because I thought it was more exciting than a superhero comic or mm -hmm. something. And uh, so um, the science fiction started to f fade out, but it, all it was was just visual. I mean, it, it had nothing to do with science, you know, so it wasn't science fiction, it, you know. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, just fun stuff to draw. Um, and it's a release, um, like I, st I still do my side, uh, story, science fiction, fantasy, uh, uh, 
story um, because I need a release once in a while from the Maggie Hopi world, which is so planted in reality. Mm -hmm. And so with Maggie and Hopi, I just try to get into the soul of being this on this planet and it drives me crazy sometimes and I need to release and so then I'll draw uh, my science fantasy and, and just go bonkers, you know, because I, I just need that, like, get me out of here, get me off the world. <laughs> so genre in that way becomes an escape of sorts. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, but I treat it both with the same intensity, you mm -hmm. know, I, I take it both very straight faced, like even if the the science fiction stuff is like, okay, then uh, they're having sex and then his penis goes to the roof or something. <laughs> That's, um, I'm still drawing it like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so. You're still cutting to the core of that situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I take it just as seriously. It's kind of like the when the Be Ringo said, that the Beatles, I'm talking about the Beatles a lot. The, the Ringo said, he goes, yeah, just because I would have one song once in a while, they work just as hard on mine too. <laughs> like, well, yeah, of course they did. Yeah. Um, in reading interviews with you both and prepping for this interview, the most common question I think you get is something about why women, et cetera. Um, and a lot is made about your abilities to create women, these uh, female characters who are actually people, um, who desire things, who hunger for things, who are messy, who are complicated. Um, why do you think that people react so strongly to this in your work? And why do you think you're still getting this question like, why women? Um, I'm not sure. I feel like that question, the, the question that you know, when people ask us that question or ask me that question, I feel like it's just this Ouroboros. Like, that kind of happens in comics criticism or any criticism. Like, once a question is kind of out in the universe, like, it just perpetuates itself. I really don't know why that is. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's like, well, you know, women are sentient beings and they have <laughs> lives, and I think I do, and, you know, <laughs> we have experiences, and... Um, I, I think a lot of it goes back to one of my favorite art critics, John Berger, who said that, like, you know, in the history of arts, like, men act, women appear. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we do kind of challenges that, and that we're always giving women action. Like, we're, you know, they have agency, they have um, character, they have personality, they have flaws. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know that it's so much that, like, these types of stories aren't being told anymore. I don't right. think that that's true. Um, I, I guess that, you know, I just guess that the idea is out there that, that this is exactly how it is and people don't understand that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Which part? <laughs> <laughs> about the Ouroboros and the stuff. Um, I mean, what do you think about, like, when people come to you and they're just like, oh, thank you so much for, you know, writing women this way. Right. Like, how does that feel? Uh, first of all, I'm just always pleased that a woman tells me that and says, I really like the way you do women. And I go, good, <laughs> good, because I like, uh, I like, uh, I love women, I love drawing women, I love writing women, I love all kinds of women, blah, blah, blah. I'm going through the history of all the question, times I've been asked the question, you know. It's been I, a lot, I was Many raised times. by a single, I was raised most of my childhood by a single mother, I guess that could be part of it. Um, uh, but one of my newest answers is uh, I, when uh, we started doing these comics, we wanted more women in comics, and we want, and not just women doing them, but we wanted to draw, to buy comics with women in them, mm. with the stories about them instead of them supporting the main character. So it's pretty simple. It's just kind of like L Love and Rockets. My brother and I had that approach. Like, well, we like women. We like drawing women. We like writing them. Let's put them in. Let's just make it about women. And then it just start. And then it started to like. It started to become like, oh, there's a reason I'm doing this, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I like I like writing these women's lives. I like that a woman character will have five reactions to a situation, and the male will have two. 
<laughs> you know, uh, guys are raised to keep cool, mm -hmm. and we won't go certain places. Mm -hmm. A woman will go from here to there to there to there to there, and uh, I I really liked that writing a woman. I just had this kind of freedom to like go as far as I could. An example is like when I write a Maggie story, I know her so well that I, I, uh, I first start off with like, this is gonna be a Maggie eight pager and stuff. But her character just takes over and just takes me further and further. And I'm like, I wanna watch where she goes here. Mm. And so that's why they become 100 pages because I'm just following Maggie like, like, wait, wait, where are you going? Where are you going? Here, hold it. Let me get my stuff. Here. You know, and, I, and she's just like, like, I'm not going to let this situation go. I'm going to make it something. And I just, I'm going like, go, girl, go, go, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I don't know. It's, I love women. I'm really interested in what you're saying about um, this idea of wanting women to buy comics and wanting them to see themselves in comics and also make comics. When did you notice that that was happening in, as a result of, maybe not as a result directly of your work, but happening around your work? Around, I, I remember when the, the Burn X-Men, Burn Claremont X-Men started to, the women started taking over talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that was like something like, it's like, look, oh, look, look, they're giving them their time. They're giving, they giving, and that was about the time we were starting drawing comics and still, still buying X-Men. Um, and I didn't really particularly think they were that well written, mm -hmm. but I did go like, look, they're there, they're here. See, that's all you gotta do. Just write the balloon and then put the woman <laughs> saying it instead of instead of a strong guy. It you know? seems so simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about. I have some questions for each of you individually um, about your newer work. Uh, but Katie, you recently put together your first solo exhibition yes. at the Naughton Gallery in Belfast, so congratulations. Thank you for doing a beautiful essay for oh, it. I was honored. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Um, but I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the process of putting together that show, and I'll bring up a couple images of it. Um, uh, let's see, I, I started working with the curator there, um, Ben Crothers. A few years ago, I was in a couple uh, group exhibitions at the Naughton Gallery, um, which is uh, in Belfast. It's part of Queen's University Belfast. Um, he did a screening program in Bushwick uh, where artists would pick a film and then draw the poster for it. Uh, and so I picked Valley of the Dolls and I drew a poster for that, um, which is one of my favorite films and I just quote it endlessly. Um, it's, I love that it's like on Criterion now. It's like legit, you know, <laughs> because for the longest time that was just like a stain on everybody's career that was in it. Um, they got out of the valley finally. <laughs> yeah, they got beyond it. And that's on Criterion too, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I don't, I'm like, everything I love is becoming okay now, and I'm like, ooh. Uh, but yeah, so I started working with Ben, um, and he's lovely, and he's someone who's really knowledgeable about comics, and he's an amazing curator. Uh, and one day he asked me if I would be interested in doing a show, ex like with just me, not a group show, at Naughton. And uh, we talked about it, and we talked about maybe doing it about maids, which I'm working on now. And then it was just sort of like, you know what? I have so much stuff already. Like, I just want to put all of this on the wall. Like, I want to take everything out of my archives, and not everything, but a lot of things out of my archives and put them up. Um, and so I flew over there. I was there um, for the first week in August. And we did installation. And let me tell you, there is nothing more stressful but like gratifying than a bunch of like really gruff union like Irish guys hanging up your like erotic comics. <laughs> like That's just awesome. like it's and they take it very seriously. It's like they're looking right at it and like, this one looks pretty good. And you're like, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was just it was really cool. I'd I'd never 
you know, I studied art history. I worked in galleries and museums, and I've seen installations, but it's a whole other thing when it's your stuff, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's getting smudged, or, or like, I don't know, is that even really good? Like, so you kind of go through this like very mini ego death <laughs> when all of that's happening. But it was really cool, and um, I got to do a painting in the gallery, which is just like a temporary piece, which is a panel from Maids. Um, did that in acrylic, and it, I was like, oh, it's been so long since I painted in acrylic, like maybe 20 years. Um, I was like, I hope this works, you know. But yeah, there it is. There it is, yep. We did a little projection, like we had to print out like a slide and project it, and I traced it and everything, and it was really nerve wracking, because I was also really jet lagged, and the Guinness there was really good, and I was really hung over a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I yeah, also, I so loved, pleased. Um, I loved how they displayed the tarot cards um, yeah, from your Bad Girl Tarot deck. I had a very fateful reading from this deck in December that changed the course of my 2019. Just wanted you to know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, we'll I, and I didn't know if they were going to be in the show or not. So I was yeah. excited when I got those pictures. Um, and Jaime, you have two books out this year. Yeah. Uh, Tonta and Is This How You See Me? Um, and with Is This How You See Me, we have this, you collected the stories in which uh, Maggie and Hopi reunite for the first time in a while, right? Yeah. Um, what were your expectations about that reunion? Well, um, at first, this, like all Maggie stories, it was going to be shorter. Um, and it was going to be a, a kind of a short story about... Uh, Maggie and Hopi go, go back to their old hometown to go to this punk reunion. And they kind of like, they're like these old ladies now, you know, and they're like, and so they go, they go to town and then they go to this movie, this revival theater and, and they have wine and they're all like, they're all like having the <laughs> best time and the, the reunion doesn't mean anything really. Uh, and and the story of uh, at first was going to be, um, but that they go, and then they go to the punk reunion, and they kind of stand in the back and, like, oh, those kids are hurting themselves, you know, like, <laughs> like they forgot that they were the same <laughs> kids that these kids are now, and 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 then they were going to go home and go, ah, well, you know, say hi to your wife, say hi to Ray, okay, mm -hmm. we'll see you next week or whatever, and that was going to be the end of the story. With Maggie and Hopi, it, I can't, I can't just let it go. I mean, they're just their their uh, personalities have just gotta clash, and and uh, in a good way and a bad way sometimes. And so it became this thing, and it started to write itself that um, that oh hey maybe uh, Hopi, the wildest of the punk kids doesn't want to go back. Mm. She doesn't want to do this thing. And so I started writing it that way and I just started to see how that affected Maggie. Like she was like, but we're gonna have fun, like the old days, it'll be fun. And then Hopi's like, well, I, I, I was kind of an ass to these people. I mean, what if they hate me? What if, you know, and, and I started going, oh, wow. Okay, cool. The re it's a reverse kind of thing, mm. like, oh. Hope it doesn't want to. So that just wrote this whole story, and it became this whole story story about that uh, Maggie thinks that they can go back, meaning, hey, we can fool around a little bit. Mm. She finds out that Hopi's like, I'm raising a five-year-old kid, and I have a wife. Like, Maggie can't do this, and Maggie's just like, oh. And so it just became this whole long long thing about basically that you can't go home again kind of thing, mm. you know? And uh, and then trying to figure out like, okay, but they're gonna run into other characters who are kind of not part of it, so they have to behave around their old friends and and stuff. But that, that, that became fun because uh, characters like Daffy finally had something to say. She was not just the, the hanger on and she had her own story in it, and I was really pleased with that. So, um, yeah, it just became it became this whole thing of like, well, can you go home again or can't you? Mm. Yeah. That's the big question that drives that yeah. set of stories. Yeah. Um, what was it like to encounter Hopi 
in this kind of very stabilized relationship, stable life that... She, I have to admit, when, uh, when she, Hopi getting older of all the characters was the hardest to write. Mm. After a while, I didn't know her. And there was even a point where I didn't like her. And I was like, and then, and instead of going like, well, when you do characters you don't like, you get rid of them. And I went, no, 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 this is, some, this is something else going on here. I don't like her because she's changing on me. Mm. You know, and, and it was kind of like I was meeting her one-on-one, -on -one, like, okay, I don't like you, Hopi. What are you gonna do about it? Or what am I gonna do about it? And so it was really interesting. Uh, writing her was so difficult. And trying to maintain this old Hopi and then this new Hopi and, the, and meeting them halfway. And uh, it was really interesting. It was like I, I, I got to know her again. Mm -hmm. And that's what helped also write the story. Um, and your latest comics work, Katie, Maids, I, um, so like I said, this is kind of your first work of historical nonfiction at a slant. Mm -hmm. um, and you're telling the story of the P P Pepin sisters, Pepin sisters? Uh, Pepin. Pepin, mm -hmm. okay, my French is terrible. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering what drew you to this story um, and how are you getting inside these characters? Because you've written fiction up until up to this point, right? Um, how are you navigating writing people who have already existed? It's tough and it's very dark, um, but <laughs> I'll start um, by saying that the Pepin sisters were uh, two maids, uh, live-in maids in France. They lived in Le Mans, uh, which is like outside Paris. Uh, they started working for this family in the 20s and then in 1933 inexplicably they killed the mother and daughter of the family that they worked for in a really really brutal uh, gruesome way uh, they gouged their eyes out while they were still alive uh, for instance yeah it's not great that's gonna be the best part to oh my god i can't wait for that <laughs> um, but anyway uh, <laughs> but it was really um it was just it's a nasty oh, got yeah, the eyeball right there yeah <laughs> that's the first that's the first page yeah uh, and uh it's just really heady and really nasty and I first heard about their story by way of um, the film La Ceremony, the Claude Chabrol film, which is actually not based on this case. It's based on a book called A Judgment in Stone, which is based on the case. Um, and then, you know, hearing about that, and I love uh, Isabelle Huppert so much, she's my favorite actor, and she was in La Ceremony, and I loved that, and then I found out she was uh, doing a play called The Maids, which uh, is by Jean Genet. She was doing that play with Kate Blanchett on Broadway, and I'm like a mere mortal, so I couldn't get those tickets. Uh, but I was like, oh, this is so interesting, like Isabelle is popping up in this story again, and so I went and, you know, once again, I have either you know, very serious Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir talking about the case, or I have somebody on a Kindle book who's like, that was awesome. So there's no, there's no really good historical like account of what actually happened. Um, there's only really accounts about the trial and sort of like the repercussions of, of this story in France at that time. And um, then there's people that are, I guess, just fans. Um, so. Uh, I was like, this is really interesting. We don't know anything about these girls, why they did this, um, and we don't know what brought them to this. We don't know what their daily lives were like. So the best that I could research, I did, um, and I was like, they, I just feel them talking to me. It's like what you always say. It's like for the yeah. first time, I'm like, something has started talking to me. And I was like, I don't feel like I need to do these girls justice, or I don't feel like I need to shed light on anything to justify what they did, because what they did is horrifying. Mm -hmm. But there is a part of me that just wants to know why. And I'm trying to put together myself and making everybody else you know, complicit in trying to figure out why they did what they did. Um, and you know, a lot of the texts that I've read about them, they are treated as uh, very feral, um, just very stupid. But to pull off a, a crime like this, there's organization, there's communication that is, you know, in this weird sort of twin speak that they had. Um, so you know, I think I think that they just owe a different light looked at them. And they, you know, there's the maids, the Genet play, which is very stiff because it's Genet. But then there's also um, films like Les Abysses uh, and um, Oh gosh, 
uh, I can't think of other ones, but they're very sensational and very, oh, these sisters, you know, they had an incestual relationship and they played that sort of thing up. And I don't know that I really buy that mm -hmm. in their story. Um, but there were just so many things around it, and I was like, I just feel like for some reason I know these girls and I want to talk about these girls. Um, and so getting into that headspace, it, you know, it's all like, haha, like fun, 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 you know, eyeballs and having a great time. But then when I really think about their lives and I think about they were orphaned and they lived in a convent and all they knew was sort of almost like a, like Charles Manson, like an incarcerated life. Like all they knew was going from institution to institution that didn't want them. And then they ended up, you know, working, uh, you know, 72 like our days basically for this family that just hated them. And uh, I was like, gosh, you know, sometimes I don't like going to work and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, how far would it have to take me? Um, but then I also think there's something really interesting about the case too in that, um, you know, France was going through its own depression at that time in the same way that we were off of uh, Black Thursday. And like three or four years after the trial was so public and such a scandal, uh, the Popular Front in France, you know, came through and you know made laws about uh, labor, 40-hour uh, work weeks, eight-hour days, lunch breaks, sick leave, all of these things that they these girls didn't have. Mm -hmm. So there's a part of me that can't help but wonder, like, did something in the unconscious, like, did this story do something to help? these laws come along because people were scared. <laughs> so um, so yeah, there, there's a lot to it. I think it's really rich. And what I think happened is that this story just kind of gets swept under as like a sensational mm -hmm. uh, folly I do. And people like to think about, oh, what happens when there's two personality disorders working against each other, that kind of a thing. But I feel like there's so much more there. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that was, that was my in. It was all thanks to Isabel Hubert. <laughs> I mean, the pages so far are beautiful, Thank and you. the color palette is really interesting too. In that, <laughs> again, yet again, I'm coming back to color, <laughs> but it, uh, it's you're using a lot more muted tones um, than you did with My Pretty Vampire. So, you know, there's this kind of like in sense of order and control a little bit, um, which I find very interesting. Thank you. Um, before, let's see. Yes, before I open it up to questions, I just want to ask you both if you have any questions for each other. Is there anything you're, you're dying to know that you haven't asked one another yet? <laughs> First of all, how dare you? <laughs> um, I asked you about the color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Hmm. Why won't you watch Real Housewives with me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I... Because at home I still have a TV that you go. Psh, psh, psh. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> All right, so if you guys are up for it, we can take questions from the audience. There are microphones on either side of the room, so um, walk, don't run to the microphones, and um, yes, yeah, so we're open. We're open to Q and A now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, this is uh, for Katie Skelly. Um, one thing I really like about My Pretty Vampire and so far with Maids, some of the other work, is how unapologetically bad the protagonists are. Um, like, there's no, like in My Pretty Vampire, there's no, you know, even with your classic anti heroes, there's justifications like, well, it's revenge, you know, or, and this is like, I mean, a lot of it's just they're bad, and, but really likable at the same time. Um, it, like, and oh, do you ever get pushback or any characters, like, I mean, any uh, fans or critics really trying to find, like, a moral undercurrent, like, oh, well, maybe they're doing it because of this, or? Do you know what the most disturbing thing to me is? It's that people come to me and they're like, your women are so empowered. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, you're really, you're telling the stories that, like, you know, we need to hear about women. Or, and sometimes I'm like, did you read, are you? Because, you know, it, it would be one thing to just kind of gas me up and say something like that, and mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, you didn't read it, that's fine. But I get it so much <laughs> that it, it's kind of strange, or that, you know, they're, they're badass, or whatever that even means. Um, I, but no, I've never gotten pushback that's been like, you know, this isn't a good thing to do, or anything like that. I don't, I feel like I'm very lucky in that people don't read what I do as like, uh, an endorsement or anything like that. I mean, knock on wood. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. To me, I just, I like a complicated question of like, is there something redeeming about the way that these women act or, you know, can we see ourselves in them? But there's no, 
like, there's no moral question around it for me. I'm just like, these are the most interesting stories for me to tell. Um, so, so far so good, but I mean, if anyone wants to yell at me, you know, <laughs> you know where to find me. <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but I'll just start with one. You said it was kind of difficult to um, write Hopi as she got older. One thing that amazes me about uh, the stories you're telling lately is uh, how you visualize them as they grow, and you've done that throughout the whole series. I, I just can't imagine how you can see into the future and figure out how they're going to look, particularly with Hopi. I thought, how did you develop Hopi's visual look as she aged? Um, it's pretty simple. I just, I just see how I age and people around me. Um, so it's not, it's not that hard. The only hard part is like, well, okay, they changed the way they dress. How, how is she going to dress now? How is she going to wear her hair? How would she make that choice? Yeah, and how would she make that choice? You know, that's that's the hard part, but that's not that hard either. It just just observing around me, people. But you do with all of your characters, and they're all instantly identifiable when they come on the scene as an older person. I just think that's very impressive. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I I I just I guess I've been working at it so long where. Uh, when I put someone in a comic, you're going to know who that is, and you're going to know who they are throughout the thing. You know, I mean, something as simple as a hairstyle, but but it's a conscious thing. I mean, I, I totally forgot that when, when I was a little kid, and we would draw our comics, and me and my brothers, and we'd make fun of each other because the character didn't look anything like they did the panel before. And sometimes they look like a movie star or something. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. hey, that looks like uh, Gary Cooper. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I forgot, I had forgotten how hard it is to keep a character looking the same. I, it's just something that's second nature, you know. You just get better at it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's unconscious when I do it, but it's kind of like, you're going to know who this is in the panel. Sometimes it's like, hi, Daffy. Oh, you know, it's Daffy. You know, so, sometimes. Uh, so, um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a thing that just goes in. Can I ask another question? Real quickly. Um, you said that uh, Tanner got to stuck with you. Uh, could, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but could you um, go back to the mic just so we can pick up the sound? Thank you. You said fanographic stuck with you uh, during the highs and the lows. Uh, what was the lowest period for Love and Rockets? The low? Yeah, you mentioned that fanographic stuck with you. Throughout oh, yeah. The, uh, well, um, there, were, there were times where we were the cool kids on the block, and then, the, and then there were times when uh, something like 8-Ball came out and we were no longer the cool kids on the block. I mean, simple stuff like that, but that never stopped us from doing the comic. And I knew that, like, well, your sales are dropping because now you're doing stories about this. I want to see Death of Speedy, you know. And it's kind of like, yes, but I know I can't give you Death of Speedy all the time. I, I can't kill a character for you all the time, you know. And so I, uh, so I just kind of hoped that people would stick with it. And some people didn't, you know. And... And then, and then uh, a lot of people come to my table and ask me, like, what, uh, like, oh, that's so great that you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we have, we have been back since 1982, man. <laughs> we have never stopped. And they go, oh, really? Oh, I guess I should. Sorry. They see the graphic, they see the collections, and they think that's original material. They don't know that that's just from the, original comic and stuff. But um, yeah, yeah, the, the lows, you know, I, uh, I stopped counting my numbers of how much we sell long time ago because uh, I don't want to know that we're not selling <laughs> very well, you know. 
you know, we have changed formats over the years, and that was not because, not mainly because, hey, we want to draw a different style. It was because if you change this format, you will get into bookstores, and you'll sell more copies. And we're like, okay, fine. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with the market. You know, just let me draw it how I always draw it. You format, format it as as that'll help, any way that'll help us, you know, so. This reminds me that um, you both um, put together a zine for SPX. You designed Jaime's drawing. Oh, yeah. um, how did that come about? Or was it just, <laughs> was it like the night before SPX? <laughs> we gotta do a zine. <laughs> this message must go out. Yes. It was, um, it was you wanted to do it, and I, and I was like, well, I can lay that out and I can put that together because I do that all the time when I'm putting out new comics. I self-publish them first and I have a vendor that I really like and I was like, we can do this like pretty quick and, you know, turn yeah. it around. Because if it was me, I would have <laughs> taken five more years until <laughs> I decided to do it. But I was like, yeah, I would just like to, I, you know, I did all these con drawings over the year. I would love to do little collections, little minis. And she was like, we can do that. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, we can do that. <laughs> you know, I'm in my house scratching my head most of the time. You know, but she just like, yeah, do it. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it also takes me five years to make a scene, so <laughs> I sympathize. Um, unless anyone has any other questions, I have one fine, oh, do we have one more? Okay, last it, question. It was really exciting hearing you all talk about sort of your, your writing processes and sort of seeing the, the distinct differences in how each of you got into characters. Uh, so I was sort of interested in how, how you each sort of came to those specific, uh, those specific writing processes of like getting into your character, your relationship with the characters, and if that was like, is that sort of a reasoned out thing where you're like, oh, this is how I want to approach it this time? Or is it more like, this is just sort of where you found yourself each with these really distinct approaches? A big question that we have one minute to answer. <laughs> um, I, more and more it's becoming, um, what do these characters like want to tell me? Um, it, hmm. Well, I guess the way that I get into writing a story is just figuring out, okay, is this going to be this character's experience? Is this going to be a third person? How much interiority are they going to have? And you know, the more times I reread Blood Meridian, I'm like, they should have no interiority. Um, and that's kind of where I'm going now. Uh, so yeah, it's just a matter of like, how much I want to know them and how much they want to show of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my, mine kind of comes natural because I've found out over the years my strengths of the best, that the stuff I'm best at putting in my comics. And one of them was just, getting into a character and making them feel so real that you forget their lines on paper. And so I'm just trying to find the soul every time, you know, and the best way I can. So that kind of takes care of everything else, you know. And uh, that's my main goal. When, when someone told me years ago, you're a good observer of people. You're a good judge. And I go, well, I'm not a judge, but, <laughs> but thank you. And I thought, oh, I guess I, I guess I observe pretty well. And so I just used my superpower, what superpower I had, you know, and I, that's been the goal and everything else falls into place. All right, so I think that's all we have time for. Um, my last question is, Jaime, when are you going to watch The Real Housewives with, Kate, with Katie? Yeah. So and many good ones. I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to be I'm going to be sitting there not, not saying a word, and she's going to be going, oh, my God. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Thank this is a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you.